So today's uh, webinar is all about uh, automation, right? So introduction to automation for engineers. Now, just by the name suggests, you might have a lot of understanding, your own understanding about automation. What is automation, uh, you know, where automation is used, how people uh, use automation to work on things, et cetera, et cetera. Right. But this webinar is going to cover one of the process in an automation where we'll try and understand uh, what is this particular process automation or, or what is this particular uh, you know, thing which is used in the industries. How are they used? Why are they used? And how helpful or, uh, are they? And we'll also try and understand what is the scope for engineers uh, who basically learn such kind of automations. And at the same time, uh, we can also see if we can uh, provide you some, you know, valuable examples of uh, such kind of automations. Okay, throughout the sessions, there might be a lot of new contents, uh, which might be taught, there might be some contents which you might already have had experience in that may be taught. Anytime during the session, if you have any queries or concerns or questions, you can feel free to basically type your question in the chat box. And uh, I'll not hesitate to answer it at the end of the session. Okay, so I'll, I'll always be ready to answer all your questions at, at the end of the session. Right, great. Uh, so to talk about the contents of today's class or the webinar, I think we'll start with uh, first. So in engineering, we have multiple domains. We'll talk about the domains. We'll talk about uh, particularly what is CAE or, or FEA. And then we'll talk about all the applications in various industries. Then we'll talk about automation. Then we'll talk about various types of analysis that can be done the fundamentals of what is required to do a simulation and post which will you know this particularly this this particular uh you know requirements will also include uh, governing equations messings boundary conditions etc and then finally we'll have a talk about the software demo okay now uh, talking about uh, what exactly is this fea so before starting with fea i would like to give you a very brief introduction about uh, what happens in an industry okay so this is what we call as pdlc right uh, so pdlc product development life cycle so this is what pdlc stands for now what exactly is product development life cycles i hope uh, most of you guys who have done uh, you know worked on engineering should have an overall idea of where does a product start and where does a product end uh, let's say for example all uh, all of us have phones today right now where are these phones, uh, you know, how are these phones made? So where do they start? Okay. So initially there'll be a group of people who will sit together, who will think of what is the requirement. They'll find out whether there's a need. They'll find out whether, whether there's a demand and according to the need, according to the demand, according to, uh, you know, all these, uh, you know, uh, all their you know, resources and everything, they'll basically, you know, sit and plan what are they going to do? When are they going to do? How are they going to do? Now, once this is decided, basically what happens is they'll start with the R&D part. R&D is basically categorized into multiple sectors, like design, uh, you know, CAE, CFD, then you have NBS, you have so many domains. Okay. Now, what do they do in each of these cases? Let's say when you talk about your phone, first for your phone to exist, there needs to be a design, right? Now, once the design is being made, you have to make sure that the design which is being made is manufacturable and at the same time you have to make sure that the design that is being made is safe or you have certain pride you know priorities right for example if you have a phone you should make sure that it doesn't explode in your, when you are using it if it falls down it should not explode right it should not break so you have certain criteria when you buy a phone so according to all these criteria you'll have to evaluate how good the design is right now this is going to be done in two ways so one is structural validity or validation, and then the other is CFD validation. Now, what is structural validation? Basically, working with the strength of the material and trying to figure out, uh, you know, what is the stress produced, what is the strain produced, how much is the deformation produced when I drop my phone? Like, is there a crack on my glass? So, all these things, and uh, then you will go on to the CFD part where they'll work on the uh, cooling simulations. Like, okay, so if my phone is being used there will be heat produced uh, because uh, there are chemical 
you know, there's electrochemistry in, involved in the batteries, right? And these electrochemistry that are involved are exothermic in nature, meaning they radiate out a lot of heat. So when you use your phone, you will have a lot of heat radiating out. So how do I basically manage this heat such that I don't have any overheating issues? I don't have any thermal failures of my batteries and other components. It's all these things is what a CFD engineer will do. Now, coming to our context today, so we primarily will be looking at the CAE or the FEA domain. So what is FEA? FEA, okay, CAE, we have a method which is FEA. And FEA is actually a method where you have a physical model. And this physical model that we have will convert or discretize this model into a set of nodes and elements. And using numerical technique, we solve for whatever unknowns we have to get approximate results. I'm repeating, FEA is basically a method where you have a physical model. For example, you have this ball. Now this ball you see in a real life is a physical model. Now people will do a design for the ball uh, in a software and they'll give it out to FEA or CFD or the analysis department. Now what they'll do is they'll discretize the model into small number of elements and nodes. Like for example, on you can see an image here, right? So this is what we call as discretization or meshing where we, you know, convert this into elements and nodes. And this conversion with this conversion will basically change this into a set of numerical equations, right? Using and, and using this equations by applying boundary conditions, we'll try and analyze and derive approximate results. Okay. Now here, as you can see, each of these particular small entities are called as elements and each of these connecting uh, points that you can see that lie on the circumference of your component are called as nodes. Okay. Please do remember what are nodes and elements. Nodes are nodes are uh, the uh, entities that are characteristic points that lie on the circumference of your object. And upon connecting all these nodes together, you have an element form. There are different types of elements. You have 1D element, 2D element, the multiple types of element, but according to the application, you will select what type of element uh, you need to use. Okay, we'll discuss that in the later part of the lecture. Right, now, I told you about, uh, so what is FEA, what is uh, design and everything. Now, what exactly is automation? Okay, so now, when I say automation, the first thing that comes to you, your mind is, uh, you know, the robots, uh, the, uh, you know, uh, artificial, uh, you know, intelligence that is being used in the industries to basically uh, work on things automatically. That is the first thing that comes to your mind, right? But when I talk about automation in terms of the R&D, uh, when you are using the software, I think here is where we'll work on process automation. Now, what exactly is process automation? I'll give you an example. Okay, let's say uh, you have a particular uh, so let's say we all spend, right? Uh, what do we spend on? We spend on multiple things. Okay. So how do we spend? We do cash. We do online payments. We do, you know, wire transfers. We do a lot of things, right? Uh, now, let's say that you are basically trying to track your monthly expenses over a particular period of time. I mean, on a particular, you know, period of time. So what is the first step which you'll do? You will calculate all the incomes. You will calculate all the, uh, you know, outgoing uh, or expenditures. And basically you'll try and categorize all these things. Like for example, transportation, right? Uh, uh, food and uh, different types of expenses are there, right? So you will basically categorize all of these things. And then probably you will come up with a chart and uh, you will basically uh, figure out uh, how uh, you know how much you have spent on what category etc now this is a very entire you know entirely a large process like starting from uh, collecting data organizing it categorizing it and then analyzing it and then working on improvements with the results now what if i say that uh, you know you don't have to do all of these things all you have to do is, you know, write a particular piece of code or basically rely on someone to write a piece of code. And all you have to do is just input your categories, let's say the input values and everything will be calculated on its own and you'll get the output results uh, as a dashboard or something, 
Now this process that is being very long, that is or a repeated process that is basically converted uh, into a very simple step uh, or a procedure is, is what we call as process automation. Another example in terms of uh, the automobile industry or, or the you know uh, uh, you know regular industries that we have. Let's say uh, you have um, a, you, are, you are having or handling a particular software. Okay. Now uh, one of the you know major things that people do is uh, when they work on components, automotive components, uh, they basically make reports. Now when they make reports, the first thing they'll need is images. Okay. If let's say they have five hundred different components uh, in a particular uh, multi assembly assembly design they will have to isolate each and every component take screenshots or take uh, you know capture images you know then you know go to a location store it with a name and then repeat the process again for another 500 times right now this is a very very tedious process as this let's say capturing one image takes you around 1 minute Capturing 500 images is going to take you 500 minutes, and 500 minutes is not something that is a very small time, right? So it is it is almost an entire day of work for just one screenshot of uh, you know a particular component. Now uh, this 500 components it will just be you know components, and when you work on them, they'll multiply and they'll become 3x, 4x uh, times bigger. Okay, and taking screenshots for reports for each of the cases is going to be harder and harder each and every day. Now, if you are going to in, in, implement process automation, what one will do is one will write a five or 10 or 15 line code to basically isolate all the components one by one in isometric views or any views, and then store it with the component name in a particular folder. Now, this is what we call as the process automation. And I think how this is done is what we'll primarily be discussing in the uh, entire lecture today. Right now, to understand this, first we'll have to understand the fundamentals. Now, what are the fundamentals? We'll have to understand what are the engineering analysis that one can do, where automation is involved in every step, and how one can uh, basically uh, work. What are the requirements for a particular engineer to become an automation engineer, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Right. To start with methods and engineering analysis, I think this is where uh, any type of analysis is being done. Right. So, for example, any analysis that you have to do. You can do it in one of these three ways. What are these three? You have experimental method, you have analytical method, and you have numerical method, right? So what is experimental method? If anything and everything that you do in real life that you might do in a laboratory um, is experimental method. And then you have your analytical method where you use hand calculations, uh, where you uh, basically use formulas and theorems to typically uh, get results. And then you have numerical methods where you take help of uh, softwares and numerical, uh, uh, you know, different numerical methods to derive results. Now, under numerical method, you have three categories. One is functional approximate, finite element, and finite difference, finite volume of finite difference. So this functional approximate is very similar to analytical, but you will do it on pen on paper. And then you have finite element where, uh, this is where what we do in FEA or CAE, and then you have finite difference or finite volume. And this uh, people from CFD domain will basically work on this using this method to derive results. Okay, we'll deep dive into what is FEM in, in the very short uh, upcoming slides. Okay, now when I talk about FEM, there are four major steps that are involved. First is physics, second is pre processing, third is solution, and the fourth is post processing. Now, what is physics? Now, you might have an understanding of what is physics, but in FEA terms of view or FEA point of view, I think physics is just understanding the problem. Now, what exactly is understanding the problem? I'll give you an example. Let's say you have, we talked about the phone earlier, right? So the mobile phones. Okay. Now, uh, imagine that you are going to do a drop test uh, on your phone from a certain height. So the category for performing the drop test on phones is basically that your phone should uh, be placed at a height of uh, between four to six feet. And uh, it should basically fall on different edges. Like it should fall on you know all of the eight corners on all of the edges and on front face screen, back side, 
different categories okay now you are going to do a drop test now physics is basically trying to understand what is going to be the angle of drop what is going to be the velocity at the point of impact where should be my boundary condition how how should be my end time of the simulation right what is the energy graphs that i have to look for what are the results that i'll have to plot how how am i going to validate the results validate in the sense verify the results right trying to do all of these things is what is physics now based on physics is what pre processing solution and post processing is going to be performed okay another example let's say you have a crane uh, you, you all know cranes in real life buildings right now if let's say you are seeing a crane now what does crane do the primary objective of a crane is to lift and uh, you know move objects right and how can the crane particularly lift or move objects so typically you'll have a vertical axis uh, i mean you'll have a long column and then a long uh, you know boom and at the end of the boom you'll have a basically a rope that will be attached on the other side there will be a counterweight that will be given to balance the lifting weight right now if we are going to do a structural analysis on this the first physics is basically try, trying to understand where is going to be the supports the fixed support how my comp, how my crane is going to move is it going to rotate or is it going to translate or is it going to uh, what is going to happen then trying to understand uh, you know where will my uh, object fail what type of analysis i am going to do and how am i going to approach so all these things is what is physics now from physics after physics you basically go on pre processing then solution and post processing pre processing is all about making the model ready for solving and then solution is all about solving for all the unknowns post processing is basically getting the results reading contours plotting graphs documenting all the results taking images of all the results and etc etc okay so this is the major steps in fe we'll go through each of the step what we'll do in detail shortly okay now when i talk about automation involved here i think you cannot have automation in physics to understand the problem uh, i think you can automate in a different way uh, but not through software uh, in general like the fe software what one can do is um, he can rely on artificial intelligence or he can rely on uh, industry 4.0 techniques where you can involve uh, sensors you can involve actuators uh, and uh, you can get live readings from the uh, the the object that you are going to analyze to figure out or understand the problem okay like for example if you are working on a furnace right if you want to find the temperature of the furnace you will need a sensor right without the sensor you will not be able to find the uh, uh find the temperature or work with uh, the particular problem right so you will have to involve both of you know real life automation uh, involving industry 4.0 or artificial intelligence and at the same time work on process automation right uh yeah so now talking about the significance of cae in general uh again yeah, before that i think um, talking about uh, the automation again you can have automation in all of pre processing solution and post processing as well right now talking about significance of cae so cae uh, is the analysis where you get a physical response from the system or of the system at any location for example if you are trying to analyze a cantilever beam you know what is a cantilever beam right so cantilever beam is a beam that is a beam, beam which is fixed on one end and it is loaded on the other end so when you do a loading on a particular end of a cantilever beam and you do hand calculations or use an analytical approach to find the results what you will have is you will basically have stress values strain values deformation values only at the ends or nodal points you will not have it in the middle of the cantilever beam or you will not have it at any desired location that you want but when you do a simulation uh, in the software software sorry you will basically get the physical response of the system at any desired location right similarly with cae i think you can predict the destructive nature or you can work on impractical loading conditions and failure modes okay similarly you can work on simultaneous calculations uh, when you are working with components such as stress pressure temperature etc in in real analytical approach or in uh, in experimental method you will not be able to see or uh, sense it but uh, when you work with i mean you can only sense it you cannot see uh, exactly how stress is produced or uh, 
uh, temperature is you know increasing decreasing except uh, on a time when you have uh, some external uh, units to aid in your uh, particular uh, particular calculation or your approach right but when you talk about uh, things in terms of ca or software you will be able to practically see you know and analyze uh, your performance and also work on optimization if necessary and at the same time uh, ca is a very low, relatively low investment and has a rapid calculation time comparing to real life tests okay imagine you you have an automobile you are manufacturing designing and manufacturing your own car now when you do this if you want to let's say do crash tests okay let's say frontal crash side crash roof crash there are so many crash tests that are done okay and let's say you want to do these crash tests and change your material every time and then find out what is the best possible material for my component or car okay practically if you see it will take so much time to you know design manufacture every time assemble every time do crash analyze results and then redo everything again right but when you talk about software i think this is all about you know one or two clicks per material and uh, once you do this you can directly run uh, simulations see how it can be done virtually and then figure out what is the poss best possible material or all the selections and uh, once after everything is done final then you can go for manufacturing do the same thing in real life and then compare the results right so that's why it's a very low invest uh, relatively low investment because if you do everything experimental it will take a lot of time and uh, cost okay now talking about uh, the applications of cae i think you have uh, various different applications uh, in different industries so you should know that there are majorly 14 different categories of industries present in the uh, world major categories like for example you have your automobile you have your aerospace right you have uh, your oil and gas you have your petroleum you have your electronics you have your uh, electrical industries you have your chemical industry you have you have uh, you know 14 different industries that are there now in each of the industry there is going to be r and d there is going to be manufacturing there is going to be you know sales marketing and feedback and all these things okay now at every stage of r and d wherever there is going to be physical components involved and you are going to load it in order to find out whether it is going to support the conditions or not you will need ca no matter if it is automobile or aerospace or anything the approach is only going to change by a very minuscule amount uh, or in you know very small amount but then eventually the end products or of how you do it is going to be same okay so what you do might change sometimes but how you do it is going to be same the approach might be different you are getting my point right so let's say you are traveling from one city to another let's say you are traveling from you know delhi to let's say uh, mumbai okay the route you take might be different so you can basically you know take multiple different routes, routes through multiple cities or multiple states or you can take a direct state highway uh, or a national highway and reach mumbai right so how you go let's say like how you go in the sense meaning you go by car or train or flight that might be consistent okay it might not change at a rapid pace but the routes you take that might change consistently right so that's what uh, you know my point of view here is okay similarly you have uh, automobile industries automotive industries like working on crash tests so you have two dummies here dummies are human replicas of uh, i mean they are human replicas uh, or mannequins mannequins you can see two dummies here like uh, you know two female dummies one with a lesser body i mean bmi body mass index and you have one with higher you know bmi and they are trying to you know do unless trying to analyze here uh, the impact uh, of you know the crash that is happening and the airbags that is, that are being blown yes. right similarly there is a frequency response analysis that is being done and you can also do aircraft simulations uh, for various you know stages of your aircraft to find out uh, factor of safety and margin of safety right now talking about the different types of analysis So you have plenty of types. You have static, you have dynamic, you have linear, you have non-linear. Okay. Now each of these analysis depends on the loading condition. So if the loading condition is uh, con constant or if it is static, then it falls under the static criteria. Meaning, 
all the loads that you apply they are they don't change over time okay for example you sitting on a chair is a static analysis okay i mean immediately if you you know analyze that is going to be static analysis but then if you want to analyze um, the effect of you sitting on a chair over a long long, long period of time uh, what is happening to my chair and stuff then that will fall into the dynamic category meaning whenever the effects of time are considered and they are analyzed they'll fall under dynamic analysis like uh, your uh, when you apply velocities acceleration time based loads etc now under static and dynamic you have linear and non linear now what is linear what is non linear so basically linear analysis is when you uh, okay so to understand linear analysis i think you'll have to understand a bit more on the stress strain curve for every material that you have in the market or in the industry or that you use we have something that is called as stress strain curve okay stress strain curve is actually uh, a graph that gives you a relationship between uh, stress and strain right now what is stress what is strain so stress uh, in, just to give you a brief stress is all about the uh, you know resistance that your material is offering when an external load is applied and strain is uh, about how much uh, of your elongation is happening compared to your uh, original length so the ratio is strain now the relationship is what is the stress strain diagram now linear analysis is when the graph that is being plotted in stress strain curve or, or the graph that is being plotted is going to be a straight line or linear or whatever analysis you do this you analyze it within the uh, elastic region of your material or within the linear region of your material so that is linear analysis okay and second thing whatever results you get on force versus the displacement that is being happening they will uh, you know very linearly only they'll not be multilinear meaning they'll not be curves they'll be a straight line and most important point is that there are no contacts involved now what is this contacts uh, typically let's say you are using your phone now how do you use your phone you use your fingers to scroll or swipe on your phone and basically you will be able to use your phone correct no matter if you are uh, you know calling or playing games or whatever you are doing and there is contact between your finger and your phone now if you consider the effect of contact meaning if you want to try and understand what is the contact pressure what is the stress or strain or displacement produced because of this then that is contact analysis and if you ignore the contacts then it will come under the linear category when the loading is linear okay an example is uh, applying load on a cantilever beam now non linear analysis is when you have non linearity in your material like it can be geometric material or contact so when you have contact it is non linear when your material is uh, the stress values or strain values of your material if it goes beyond elastic zone then it is material non linearity and you, when you have large deformation then that is geometric non linearity right now speaking of non linear analysis like uh, as you can see here is an example of a frontal car crash simulation that is being done okay now talking about automation here so here you can see all three types of non linearity your model undergoes large deformation your model undergoes uh, your material non linearity meaning your stress which is being produced or strain that is being produced is higher than the elastic limit and there are contacts now when i talk about automation or process automation okay like as you can see here this particular car or the you know biw of your particular car is traveling at a certain velocity like according to standards there are fmvs standards or nvh stand, uh, uh, your not nvh uh, your n cap standards sorry right that are being used to monitor or to set a benchmark and understand uh, uh, you know uh, understand all the uh, you know results and also to have parity parity in a sense equality uh, so basically uh, every car that is being designed they will have to follow a certain standard and be tested in a similar way so that you know parity is uh, maintained right now automation here can basically be involved when let's say you have a car and you want to analyze uh, or do a simulation in different uh, with the different materials uh, with uh, different uh, thickness of your components with uh, let's say to even more complex it with different velocities okay now all you have to do is write a code to make sure that 
for every iteration the material changes then the thickness of the components changes then your uh, velocity changes at each time frame at each uh, uh, each iteration and then it computes your results at every time so you can write a very simple code now this code that you write uh, you don't have to actually have a prior coding knowledge to learn such kind of coding for automation all you have to do is have a little bit of interest to know what it is and to try and uh, work with uh, you know whatever things are responsible okay you can use a lot of coding tools such as python or there's a high level programming language called a tcltk right you can use matlab you have plenty of coding tools that you can use to perform automation right so yeah so this is again one such example of automation here okay now next part which we'll cover is the governing equations now what is governing equations governing equation is basically the formula or the equation that is basically used to calculate everything i told you that initially that uh, your model is converted into a set of numerical equations now how are these numerical equations validated or what are they based on they are based on this particular equation that is mx double dot plus cx dot plus kx equal to f of t where m is your mass c is your damping uh, k is your stiffness you have x double dash, dash as your acceleration the again x dash or first derivative of, of x which is velocity x as displacement and f of ts the external force that is being applied okay now according to what type of analysis you do be it static or linear static non linear static vibration problems uh, your equation will change okay because in static analysis you don't have time based loading meaning acceleration velocity will cut out it will be zero because acceleration is velocity by time you have a time dependent parameter velocity is displacement by time you have a time dependent parameter so this and this will be zero which means this entire term and the entire term will be zero and k and f of t will be constant x is your displacement that you will have to find out okay in case of a non linear static analysis meaning when you have contacts okay even for non linear you will have these to be zero the the first term and the second term to be zero but instead of your k and f of t as constant we'll have k as a function of your displacement and f of t uh, as constant similarly when you have forced vibration problems you don't have any damping nor do you have external force so your uh, damping c or this entire term is zero and your f of t is zero thereby leaving your equation to mx double dot plus kx equal to zero or where m and k are constant uh, when you have forced vibration the entire equation is used so what i'm trying to tell you here is this is one such kind of equation that you or any you know fea software might use to actually calculate or work with uh, the unknowns right the next part is meshing meshing is one of the most important uh, parameter for uh, ca analysis right and most of the automation that is being performed the process automation that is being performed are uh, basically done uh, in meshing just give me a minute So talking about meshing, meshing is all about meshing is all about uh, you having a certain component and you have a certain degree of freedom in your component and you reduce this degree of freedom that is infinite to a finite number. Now, how do you have infinite number? When you have a component or a geometry, you can basically plot multiple points on your geometry. And this number of points that you can plot is infinite. So, uh, if you want to analyze with infinite number of points, you cannot actually uh, solve any problem. Okay. So, if you want to analyze, you'll have to bring down the infinite number of points to a finite number. And this process is what we call as meshing. As you can see here, your entire car is basically structured into small number of nodes and elements. And this process is what we call as meshing. Now, like I discussed earlier, there are lots of types of elements and meshing that you can use. So majority of the time, if you are going to decide a mesh, it is going to be based on size and shape, analysis type, and the time required to finish the task. Okay. Uh, now significance of mesh is um, the better your mesh is, the better will be your accuracy. And uh, the 
you know, depending on the size of the mesh, you will have different speeds of your simulation. Okay. In short, good quality mesh will result in precise results. A poor quality mesh can result in convergent difficulties or lead in false results or incorrect results. Next is boundary conditions. So boundary condition is all about, uh, you know, trying to understand what are the different uh, loading conditions are or the nature of loading conditions in different locations that are being provided. So uh, in short, you have two types of boundary conditions, geometric and natural or essential and non-essential. Essential boundary conditions are the ones uh, or the conditions without which your component cannot be stable or it cannot exist in equilibrium. And non-essential boundary conditions are where every other loading condition is applied. Like as you can see on the right side, there's a bar hanging from the wall. If you want to fix your bar on the wall, you will need a fixed support. And to analyze the elongation, you'll need some loading like gravity loads and etc. Now the fixed support that you have provided at location one is essential. The other loading condition that you have provided at number two is non-essential. Okay. Now uh, talking about automation, I think uh, so like I discussed an example earlier, so what we are going to do is we are going to use a CA software. This software is HyperMesh. HyperMesh is a pre-processing software where we do meshing and we can work on automation uh, on the process. Okay. So this is how your software looks like. So hope my HyperMesh screen is visible. Right. Uh, so here, this is your you know, title bar, you have your, you know, menu bar, then you have your main toolbars. This is your toolbar. And this is also your toolbars. And this is your graphical user interface. And these are also your, you know, tools in your tools panel. And this is your browsers. How do you work with this? So typically you can use a mouse. Like if you, you can, you know, if you press control left mouse and rotate and, and move, it will rotate. Control right mouse will pan and then control middle mouse will uh, basically control middle mouse in the sense if you scroll it will basically be able to zoom in and zoom out okay so for our particular uh, you know example or software demo here what i've done is i've taken a suspension assembly of a particular car okay so as you can see there are multiple components you have your suspension you have inside this suspension if you basically hide some of the exterior parts you'll have your you know, sp springs, right? Your hydraulic uh, parts and here you'll have, you know, other components as well, right? So then uh, you'll have your, uh, you know, AMs, you'll have your, uh, you know, uh, all your steering units attached to your, uh, you know, wheels, you'll have your rims, you'll have your, uh, you know, you'll have your, uh, you know, all these uh, holders, your tires, your brake discs, your, uh, you know, brake pads, the brake assembly, everything here, right? Then you'll have your uh, place for your axle, uh, you know, front axle or rear axle to go in, uh, all these things. Okay. Now, why I've taken this component is to show an example like we discussed in the first. So this is, this might look like a, you know, not a very complex component, but if you look at the number of components in your assembly, you have somewhere close to 120 components. Now, what is the common procedure for taking screenshot? So what I'll have to do is I'll have to basically go here, isolate this component, put it in an isometric view. Okay. And I'll have to take screenshot, uh, from one of these, uh, tools here. Okay. And I'll have to select a location where I want to save the screenshot. Let's say, uh, I'm going to create a new folder. Let's say I'm going to name it screenshot. And inside this folder, I have to give a name. What is going to be the name? Let's say imported one. So whatever is the name of the component, I'm using the same thing. And I'll have to save it as a JPG file. Now, once this is done, if I go into this SS file, I'll be able to see the screenshot of the image that I've taken. And now this almost took me close to you know, 30, 40 seconds. And imagine uh, me doing the same thing for all of these 120 components and then repeating it after I mesh and then repeating it again. I mean, after I mid surface again, after meshing. So it's almost going to be thrice the work, right? Now what I can do here is I can basically use 
a very simple uh, tool here which is called as tcltk tcltk is a high level programming language that is uh, in hypermesh uh, that is actually used to uh, basically automate or work with coding okay now hypermesh is built on tcltk okay that is uh, you know what is in one shot to give you example let's say once after installing hypermesh there is something called as a command file now this command file is where uh, you will have all the record of uh, every work that you do in hypermesh uh, be uh, you know recorded or stored okay so what i'm going to do now is so this is the last record of uh, stuff that is being made so if let's say you rotate okay what will happen is you'll be able to see that there'll be uh, you know some lines of code that will be produced so after the 67200 as you can see i rotated so at what point i rotated what is the degree of rotation so where is the you know location of rotation everything is recorded okay if i press f f is fit screen again you will be able to see that it will modify and at line number 67222 you'll be able to see that uh, an a code is being written like win star window 00000 which is fit screen so every single operation that is being performed if i do isometric or if i do uh, uh you know a situation to you know set my component in uh, a plane view rear plane view yz plane view everything is basically being recorded in this particular uh, folder and this particular folder whatever keywords or you know things you are able to see is what is the fundamentals of your tcltk okay now what we are going to do now is we are going to perform a very simple code for screenshots so i've already written this code so this code is just a you know 13 15 line code right now uh, so don't worry about the details so i'll teach you you know line by line uh, on the you know very overall brief about what is this about so what i'm going to do is the first line is all about uh, you know deleting snaps deleting snaps is all about uh, so what i've done here is i've created a folder here which is called a screenshot now this screenshot folder is empty and uh, every thing that is being stored here whenever i run this code is going to be uh, erased so how do i do that i can you know basically do this and the next thing is file mk uh, dr so mk dr is basically trying to tell my software that okay so every file that is going to be generated is going to be stored in this particular directory now this directory i'll i'll define later okay in line number 14 okay what i'm doing now is i'm basically creating taking all the components that are present in my component and i'm storing it in a variable a okay this puts one is actually a, a rough uh, line you can ignore right so puts one is just printing one it will just print one uh, the number one okay in line number 6 you have a for each command for each command is a loop command that is used to loop uh, something for a, a particular number of iterations so what we are doing is let's say we have 120 components you know all the names of or all the entities of 120 components are stored in this variable a and for each variable or each component that is being stored in this particular variable a is going to be you know executed for screenshot so what we are doing is we are setting the title of the screenshot so when you take screenshot what i am doing is the name of the component is going to be the name of my screenshot that i am going to save okay then i'm working on creating a component then i'm switching on the elements switching on the geometry isolating the component then setting it in isometric view then fit view and i'm saving it in this particular location as this title of my component okay so let's see what happens if i execute this so i'm saving this going to hypermesh and here what you can do is you can go to file run tcltk script and probably run this uh, screenshot code if i run this what will happen is something will have some the code will run automatically i'm not doing anything so it is can you see here it is reading and isolating every single component one by one and it is taking screenshot on its own and it is saving at the corresponding name so let it run for the entire component so there are so many components here so let it run so each of the 120 component that was present
is basically screenshotted. Yeah. And once this is done, it will stop. And then what we can do is we can just switch on all the geometry back on and then, uh, sorry, and then put this back to uh, the plain view. Okay. Now, previously the screenshot folder that I took was empty. Now, as you can see, I have 120 screenshots. Now, each of the screenshots is saved with the corresponding folder name and whatever images I had, they are all set in the isometric view. You're getting me a point, right? So for the entire 120 screenshots, it hardly took me a minute. Okay. Whereas if I did it manually, just for one screenshot, it, ha it probably took me around 30 to 40 seconds to take it. So you're able to understand the uh, concept of automation here, right? So this process automation is what is, uh, being, uh, done in the industry in a lot of uh, companies. And, uh, there are a lot of requirements currently for automation as well in, in the market, uh, specifically for meshing engineers and for automation engineers in the market. And what they require is someone who is well versed with one of the tool like HyperMesh or ANSA or pre-processing tool who knows how to mesh and also how to, you know, work on automation and stuff. Okay. Uh, yeah. So this is, uh, what is all about, uh, the automation and the software demo for today. So thank you so much for, uh, you know, listening to all the content patiently.